evening and welcome to Kendall Park Baptist Church. We are going to start our missions conference together with hymn number 22. Oh, I lost my paper already, Pastor. I think it's 22 and it is to the, thank you, in this book. It is number 22, okay? And we, it is to the tune of Standing on the Promises. So if you need the music, if you feel like singing parts, it is hymn number 175. All right, we are going to sing the first, second, and the last. Going forth to conquer in the Master's name, marching forth together with our hearts all flame, telling in the highways that the Savior came, doing what the Savior said to do. joining us we are in page 22 of the handout that is in the corners of your uh, pews we're singing it to the tune of standing on the promises join us on the second jesus said to teach of him in every place jesus said to tell the lost of saving grace soon we'll stand to give account before his face have we done what jesus said to Singer, remain standing for prayer. Amen. So, you know, when we sing a song like that, I always have to ask the question, uh, how well have we done in following the advice of that song, going, telling, doing what the master said to do together? So I always like to be encouraged, uh, opportunities to share the gospel this week so far. I know we just did this on Sunday, but anybody take an opportunity or capitalize on the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody this, this uh, three days into this week already, four days into it. Anybody, anybody, everybody, love to hear testimony, how God used you to do that. Okay, now let me just ask you, do you think you're going to have opportunities this week to tell the gospel with somebody? I think we're going to have opportunities. Will we capitalize on those opportunities? That's a different question, isn't it? So I really hope and pray that we'll be able to do that. That would be great. Well, listen, uh, I, I love the songs. Uh, maybe a couple different words here, but uh, familiar tunes. Uh, Appreciate Elizabeth Scherzer playing for us on the piano, and of course Hannah here on the clavinova and Betty on the organ. And so we're grateful for the music, but the lyrics, again, are going to challenge us anew and fresh, and I hope and pray that it will make a difference. Uh, we're going to be led in prayer by Jonathan Scherzer, and uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself after he leads us in prayer. And after he leads us in prayer, you can then be seated. So Jonathan, come uh, lead us, and we will go from there. All right. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you for this conference where we can renew our, our commitment and our desire to do what we ought to be doing, to share your word around the world. Lord, I pray that you'll be with this church, help them to grow stronger. Lord, be with this conference this week, be with those traveling in uh, this week, give them safety. And Lord, may we glorify you in all that we do. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Right. Thank you. Well, we're excited to be with you. We are the Scherzer family. Now, an easy way to remember our name so you can say it again is to think of a shirt and sir. Put it together. The Shirt Sir family. Never forget it. 
and we're thrilled to be here up from Florida, so it's a little bit colder here than where we're used to. And we're going to Belize where it's even warmer, so this will be the last time we see snow in a while. Um, but I enjoy some of the cooler weather. We're excited. I didn't realize until I walked in, I've been here before. I was with my brother Kyle visiting the Iwanowitz family just before he and Marina got engaged, and we came on a dark night and just came into the church service. I didn't recognize the outside of the building, uh, but when we came inside, I said, I know I've been here before, and so it's good to be back. Uh, we're on deputation to the country of Belize in Central America, and right now we're at 69% of the support that we need raised after about a year and five months of deputation, really praying to move there towards the end of this year. So we're looking forward to sharing some more about the ministry throughout the next couple of days, and we're very excited to be with you. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that very much. Uh, so this is maybe the last of the snow that you'll ever see. Uh, doesn't that disappoint you? That's terrible. <laughs> A anybody want to get in their suitcase and go to Belize with them? Uh, don't raise your hand. Uh, you can't go. You're stuck. You've been tugged. We're glad to have, uh, have you here. There's plenty of work to do in this mission field. Amen. There really is. But uh, we're happy for people to go down to Belize. We almost took a, a youth group down to Belize here a year or so ago. Uh, uh, Adrian Burden was down there doing a, a short-term trip. And I'm thinking, uh, were you already with us, uh, Jared? I'm trying to think of you were not here at that time, so it must have been a year and a half ago, two years before you came. And uh, we were really hoping to get down there. Uh, but we just couldn't get it all together. Just couldn't get a lot of the interest on the, on the part of the teens. Uh, Belize is uh, like a no-brainer. They speak our language even. I mean, we can go down there and communicate with people. It's one thing to go to a foreign field and you feel terrible. You, you, you want to talk, but you can't. But Belize, you got it all. Uh, so maybe we'll be down after all. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll have to get there one of these years, but that'd be great. Well, we are glad to have you with us tonight. Trust the Lord will bless our time together. We're going to sing another song in our and our little uh, booklet here so this is going to be we want to encourage you to leave this behind when you leave tonight because we only made so many of them we'll make more if we have to but but uh, take your little booklet there and turn to the very last page number 24 we're going to sing he hath called us and that is going to be to the tune of uh, face to face hymn number 511 for the instrumentalists you can lead us in song jared that'd be great all right we're going to sing all the verses of this stand with me as we sing <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Again, thank you, musicians. I appreciate your ministry. Let me just, uh, by way of just a couple brief announcements, remind you, um, uh, tomorrow, 12 noon, lunch for our seniors, and that's up at Confectionately Yours. Uh, maybe you didn't sign up, but there's still time for you to come. Uh, some of you might not, or might be thinking it's pretty expensive to go to that restaurant, but uh, it's off the menu, so you can order whatever you want. If you want to just get a salad, just get a salad. So you get whatever you need to, but do come and enjoy some time with these missionaries. The Bayless's will be joining us. Uh, they are not here tonight. They are finishing up at another missions conference in South Jersey. So they flew over from Spain to be with just two churches this time around. So they're down in South Jersey taking care of uh, a missions conference. They'll be with us tomorrow and then through the rest of the conference Sunday. And then they fly back to Spain on Monday. And uh, they'll be back later in May, I believe it is, uh, to finish their furlough. And so they'll be here from May through November, I believe, at that point. So the Bayless's will be joining us. And then we have, of course, uh, the Santos family coming in on Friday night. And so we're looking forward to their ministry as well. And so there's a couple other families. Just tonight we only have two. And we're grateful for the two families. Bill Fennell is going to introduce his family in just a few minutes here. And so that would be great. Tomorrow the missionaries will be with us. Seniors, come. Come one, come all. Even if you didn't sign up, say something to us. Let us know uh, so we can make uh, the proper arrangements at the, uh, the restaurant. That would be great. And then uh, Saturday morning, I'm sorry, Friday morning, uh, men's breakfast, 6 o'clock. And I'm looking at a few of you men out there that uh, you need to get signed up. I don't believe you are on the sign-up sheet. I looked that over. So uh, s uh, let me know. The sign-up sheets are removed, uh, but you can let us know that you'll be here. Just come. Uh, get here. Uh, tell your boss maybe, or ask your boss. I should say you shouldn't tell your boss, but ask him if you can maybe be a little late that morning. Uh, but uh, try to get here at 6 o'clock. We'll get you fed and happy and out of here by about noon, I think, something like that. No, that's not true. We'll get you out of here whenever you got to leave. But uh, do come and enjoy some time with us. That would be great on, on Friday morning. And then the ladies' brunch on Saturday. And so you know the drill. Uh, a number of you have been to some of it before. Some of you it's new to. And so I hope and trust that the Lord will bless and use it in a great way. So that's just a couple things that are happening this week. By the way, do be praying for Friday night. Our C clubbers should be with us, and so that should be a fun night. Uh, uh, with uh, I don't know what we have sixteen of those uh, three to five year olds with us. Um, uh, so that should be whoever gets Children's Church that night. That's going to be no. We're not going to torture you completely that bad. Churchers are doing Children's Church tonight, uh, so they're going to be sweating. They're all of a sudden going to get sick on Friday night. I'm not feeling well here. Uh, but uh, that's just uh, the little guys, and then there's some bigger guys as well. So we'll hope to have a good night. Hope they all come out. So you pray to that end. Love to have the Sea Clubbers come and see, meet some real missionaries. Uh, that would really be a blessing. So, All right, uh, that's it. I want to remind you there will be a plate in the foyer. It's marked uh, Love Offering. And, again, that's how we do it here at Kendall Park Baptist Church. We don't pass a plate. We just put a plate in the foyer. And uh, people have been very good uh, to our missionaries in past years, and we don't believe this year should be any different. And so as the Lord lays it on your heart, you want to give to the missionaries, you put something in there, and, and uh, we'll take care of their expenses. You take care of, again, expressing uh, your love and appreciation for what God has called them to do, and that would be great. All right, that's all the announcements that I have. I'm going to ask Jared to come back. He's going to lead us in another song, and then we'll go from there. All right, number 20 in your pamphlet, and it is I Am a Debtor. We'll be singing it to the very familiar tune of He Leadeth Me, hymn number 295 in your hymn book. Sing all the verses, stand with me as we sing. Christ loves them all, he died for all, will save all those who want him more. What they can call unless they know, so we too.
excellent singing tonight. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say thank you to our musicians. They can take a break if they'd like to at this time. We're going to have uh, Dr. Bill Fennell come. He's going to introduce himself and his family to us here in the ministry that God has called him to, unique ministry after pastoring for some 20 years. Uh, well, pastoring, assistant pastor, involved with a Christian school, a number of different things. Uh, God has uh, redirected his past to serve in a new ministry. And so we're anxious to hear what God is doing in the Fennel family and how the Lord is leading there. And so, brother, you come and share, introduce your family and let us know. And then he's going to go right into a DVD presentation. And then we'll be back for some special music and we'll go from there. So, brother, come Thanks, and, preacher. and uh, Thanks, share. Pastor. That would be great. Thank you so much. And you, um, and you brought your box with you. You I are did. all hooked I up. My boom, my boom box. Hey, preacher, um, how do I put the... We'll put it down. Okay, all right. Ready? Yeah, ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Yes, sir. Ready when you are. Well, good evening. It sure is a blessing to be here at Kendall Park of Baptist Church. And thank you so much, Pastor Brown, uh, for the opportunity uh, to be here. I know this, after being a pastor 15 years, though we would like to, it's absolutely impossible to schedule every missionary that calls your office. And uh, again, though we'd like to, it just isn't possible. We'd like to preach sometimes too, right? And so uh, we just like to pause and thank the pastor for the opportunity to be here and present our ministry and our family at your church. And um, of course, it's even a, a, an extra special, special blessing uh, to be in your missions uh, conference. And so we're going to go ahead and, and try this here, try this out. And I want to thank uh, Jared in the back uh, and Pastor for helping with all of the technical electronic details. I was not an electronic technical pastor. I'm not a technical missionary. And uh, you all know what an IT guy is. I'm a TI guy. That means technologically incompetent. And so um, I jokingly say wherever I go that if this doesn't work, I am prepared to present my ministry through an interpretive dance routine. So you might want to pray. That's a joke. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's a joke, though. Some of you might want to see that, and you know who you are, but that, that is definitely a joke on many levels. So we'll go ahead here. And uh, by the way, we, we've already enjoyed ourselves. The food has been phenomenal. The fellowship has been great. And did I mention that the food has been phenomenal? And so thank you so much for taking great care of us. And we'll go ahead and introduce our family. By the way, my name is Bill Fennell, but I'm not the Bill Fennell, okay? I know that there's a more uh, popular Bill Fennell that has visited on occasion uh, your church. And so anyway, I'm going to step down here because um, I'm having a problem here with this uh, reaching. So we'll go ahead and just stand here in the middle. Uh, this is a picture of my family. Uh, this is our prayer card. You can get that on the table in the foyer. And uh, Amy and I are so blessed. We have five boys. Uh, I jokingly say I have five boys and no hair. And there is a connection there uh, <laughs> between those two uh, facts. And, um, and so my son, Bill, uh, there on the far right. And then our second son, Drew. Chad is right in the middle. And then right below him, Gabriel. And then our little mini Cooper that we're blessed with, our six-year-old. And, uh, and so that, that's the Fennel family. Just a little bit about myself. I grew up in New England. I grew up in Maine and New Hampshire. And I was saved at the age of seven. My grandmother led me to Christ uh, after going to church with her. Uh, and so I, I uh, came home after the service and I said to my Grammy, I want to go to heaven. How do I go to heaven? And she opened up her, uh, her big old King James Bible and sat down next to me. And, and uh, I, I bowed and uh, asked the Lord uh, Jesus Christ into my heart as a seven-year-old boy. And so I praise the Lord for my grandmother's testimony. Um, I went to um, uh, Pensacola Christian College and met my wife, Amy. And after we graduated and were married, we had the privilege of working for the college for a few years, traveling all over the country. That was a, a great experience for us. And then the Lord brought us to my uh, wife's home church in Mansfield, Ohio, the Mansfield Baptist Temple, where for six years I was the childish pastor or the children's pastor, as some would say. And uh, we really enjoyed our time there. Mansfield Baptist Temple is such a near and dear church to our heart, and we praise the Lord for them. After six years of being at Mansfield Baptist Temple, the Lord brought us to uh, my first and only pastorate, uh, the Mount Vernon Baptist Temple, where we've had the joy to be the pastor there for 15 years. And I must tell you that one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in ministry is to uh, stand behind the pulpit at Mount Vernon Baptist and hear myself say those words that I was resigning. Uh, that was very difficult for, for numerous reasons. First of all, we were able to see a tremendous blessing at Mount Vernon Baptist, and uh, God certainly receives all the glory and the credit and the honor for that. 
Uh, but the main reason why it was difficult is because we sure love our church family. Um, I know every pastor believes and ought to believe that he has the privilege of pastoring the greatest people in all of the world, and I certainly uh, felt that way. And uh, for 15 years, I had the wonderful joy as a pastor, as a father, as a husband, to watch my church family um, love on my family. And I'll tell you, uh, that just brings great joy uh, to have, uh, be a part of a church like that. And so uh, it was a very difficult thing to resign, uh, but it's what God had for us. And how did that all come about? Well, it all came about because of a missions trip. Uh, I know pastors heard that before, uh, that it all started with a missions trip, and then the Lord called that individual to the mission field. And that's what happened with me. One missions trip turned into six. And four of those missions trips were with a ministry called Worldview Ministries. And when I was on these uh, missions trip with uh, Worldview Ministries, I was made aware of a statistic that is really, Church Family Tonight has just turned our world upside down. And that statistic is this, that more than half of the languages of the world do not have a Bible. Uh, of the 7,099 languages in the world today, and by the way, I didn't even know there were 7,099 languages in the world. To, I, I must confess, I, I didn't know that as a pastor. But get this, of the 7,099 languages in the world today, 3,876 of those languages do not have one verse of Scripture in their language. And God used that statistic to break my heart, to burden my heart. I could not believe that in our day of communication and technology, 3,876 people groups are still waiting for the Word of God. Now, pretend for just a moment, uh, just a little quick object lesson here, okay? Uh, just pretend for a moment that here in the United States, we have no Bible. Uh, absolutely no Bible. Aren't you thankful for your Bible? Amen? Uh, many of you have more than one Bible that you've collected through the years sitting on your shelf and and uh, just pretend for a moment we have absolutely no Bible at all. And a missionary from another land comes to our country, our state, our county, our uh, township, knocks on our door and for the very first time introduces you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Shows you their Bible. Now, mind you, you cannot read their Bible, but they show you the Bible, the, the Word of God. Now, think about this. You have one of two choices. Either believe everything that missionary says is true, or, and praise the Lord, that happens as missionaries go all over the globe giving the gospel. Uh, or you can learn their language so that you can read the Bible and verify what that missionary is saying is true. That would be very difficult for me, especially if it was the language of um, Romania. There's the Romanian language there. Maybe someone knows, can read that verse in Romanian. Or how about this, the language of Thailand? Or how about the number one language in the world today, Mandarin Chinese? I think you'll agree with me when we see that same Bible verse in what is called our heart language. It certainly is a lot more uh, powerful, amen, it certainly can do a whole lot more for us. How many of you knew that was John 3.16? Put your hand up. We have some Bible translators in our midst. That's wonderful. Very good. Um, and, and here's the object lesson uh, tonight. The point for this little object lesson is simply this. 3,876 people groups in the world today cannot read John 3.16 as you're reading it right now in your heart language if English is your heart language. And so that's why Worldview Ministries started. It began to do two things. Uh, started, it started for, for two reasons. Number one, to train Bible translators so that secondly they can translate the scriptures into the heart languages of the unreached people groups of the world. The 3,876 people groups still waiting for the Bible. God has blessed our, our ministry tremendously in the last uh, eight years. We're fairly new ministry, only eight years old, by giving us seven Bible translation projects. Two in India, two in Uganda, one in China, one in Tibet, and one in Myanmar. What you're seeing now is the American missionaries that head up these projects as well as their translation teams that are translating the scriptures into these specific languages. And uh, while you're looking at these missionaries and their translation teams, let me just say that all of these projects are going on even now as we speak through faith, meaning that God is using Christians and God is using churches in the States to give so that these projects can continue to go on. Let me give you an, a, a couple of illustrations of that. Dr. Ken Fielder was in a church in Georgia that got so excited about Bible translation that they took up a series of love offerings and handed him a check for $13,000 that funded one of our projects for one full year. Now, contrast that story with this one. The first time that I shared Worldview Ministries with my home church, Mount Vernon Baptist Temple, Mount Vernon, Ohio, a little boy by the name of Brennan came up to me afterwards and he said, Pastor, here, he gave me 22 cents for Bible translation. 
Now, I know that you know this, church family, but God can bless both gifts. God can magnify those as he sees fit. But the point is, God's people are getting excited about the propagation of the word of God to the unreached people groups of the world. What we'll do at this time, hopefully, if this works, is we're going to go ahead and highlight one of our Bible translation projects. It's uh, our project in Uganda, one of our projects in Uganda. And so we'll go ahead and, and show that at this time, and then we'll take some questions. As Christians, we are people of nothing with which to build the people of our churches. And yet, there are approximately 4,000 people groups in the world today that are still without the Word of God in their heart language. Getting the scriptures to these people must become our number one priority. The heartbeat of worldview ministries is Bible translation, but the ultimate goal of Bible translation is church planting. And how do we plant churches without the Word of God? How do we train believers? How do we disciple people without the Word of God? Translation work is underway in a number of unreached areas around the world. One such project is taking place in the African country of Uganda. Right now in the town of Imbarara, a team of dedicated Ugandan men and women under the direction of Dan Olashe are translating from the original languages into the Rundin Kore language. God has, has really opened the door in Uganda for us to be able to plant churches, raise up Christian leaders, and see a church planting movement begun. And the Bible is the crucial and critical element. The goal is to provide for the Banyan Kore people an accurate formal equivalent translation that will be fundamentally sound and will enable solid churches to be built based on the Word of God. What you have translated was from a full verse from the Kiyan, and we need a specific passage to take it. In order to ensure accuracy and readability, a detailed process has been developed for checking and rechecking the translation. For the New Testament, each verse has been translated from the Greek using the aid of an analytical lexicon and good Bible software. These tools take each word as it is found in the Greek New Testament and tell its form in the Greek language, enabling translators to use their Greek resources and training to bring the word into their own language. The verse then goes to another translator who will check the Greek information to be sure each detail of the word has been brought into the chosen Rundin Kore word. Carefulness in this step helps to ensure a literal and accurate translation. The next step for the verse is to go to a committee of two translators who will check the wording of each verse and how the verses work together as a paragraph. The paragraphs are then put together into a chapter which next goes to a committee of three translators who will do final checking for accuracy, wording, and punctuation. You, you do a great work. You have to be careful because now it's not just a book. It's not the thoughts of man. You are dealing with the word of God. If you don't bring across what God intends for the people, you, are, you have the key and you are locking the door instead of opening it. We are very careful about translating the word of God before we start, we have to first pray for God to give us wisdom and fill us with His Holy Spirit so that He can guide us in doing the right thing. The chapters are then printed and sent to 12 people in the villages who have been chosen from various groups of people, representing a broad spectrum of ages and educational levels. They will proofread or have the passages read to them for readability and understanding. A copy is given also to the supervising missionary to proofread. The comments brought back are compared again to the Greek to balance accuracy with readability. The Runyon Kore translation is then back translated into English by someone outside of the translation committee. This back translation is used to check the Greek accuracy with other translators. A verse is not considered finished until no less than 21 people have looked at it through the various stages. By God's grace, at this point, an accurate fundamental translation has been achieved. This process has been going on in the Runyon Kore translation 
at a rate of over 200 man hours per week since 2007. Today, the New Testament is finished and is currently going through final checking processes. Recently, an American church generously printed and shipped 250,000 John and Romans booklets, which include the plan of salvation, for use in the Runyon Kore speaking areas. I can speak easily and uh, comfortably, other than translating from English to Nyankore. In some words, which I usually, I don't get the real meaning, but when I am preaching in my language, I get the real meaning. I don't have to feel guilty when I'm giving somebody the Bible, because I know that I'm giving them a good translation, and that translation will change their life. God is already working through the copies of John and Romans to win many souls to Him and to strengthen believers and churches. As God provides through His people, the Old Testament translation will be underway soon, and with it, the potential for impacting not only the Banyan Kore people, but a large portion of Eastern Africa as well. Uganda is uniquely situated where if we can train Christian leadership, those men and women can go into these other countries around East Africa, Sudan, Congo, uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, and they can minister in those areas uh, in a way that American missionaries can't to reach the people of these six or seven other nations in this area that are hurting for the gospel. Worldview Ministries is committed translating the Word of God for people who have no scripture in their heart language. Here in the Runyon Kore project, we have the personnel in place. They are already working, and the project is fully underway. We are asking God to burden the hearts of His people to get involved and support this financially so we can see this through to the very end. Please ask God what part He desires you to have in providing the written Word of God to the unreached people of Uganda. The uh, country of Uganda is, though a very small country, uh, there are 45 different languages spoken in that country, and so there's great potential. We have two uh, translation projects going on even now uh, in Uganda. One, as you could just uh, see, is getting ready to print their very first New Testament, and uh, we're hoping to have that done and ready to pass out uh, at the end of the summer, and so we're praying uh, that uh, that'll be the case, and we, if so, we'll, uh, I'll have the opportunity to go there and to be a part in that, um, that ceremony, it's gonna be exciting. Does anyone have any questions uh, about uh, our ministry, Worldview Ministries, uh, about uh, our, our family um, specifics? Uh, yes, sir. Great question. Yes, sir. This is usually the time uh, when I, I share that. I'm not going to be a Bible translator, though I wish I could be. I do not have, at age 48, I do not have that back, background, that training, that education. Um, my job, I, I've been given a title of Director of National Training, and though I'll go overseas four or five times a year serving the various projects in different ways, my main, my main ministry will be here in the States, um, raising awareness, raising funds for Bible translation, preaching missions conferences, and going from church to church to church. So I'll be a representative, if you will. Um, they were very kind to give me a nice title, but that's what I'll be here in the States as, as a representative for Worldview Ministries. Great question. Someone else? Yes. Okay, that's a great question. Um, we have literature on the table. Uh, there are about, if you know anything about India, there's, uh, I mean, of the 7,000 languages in the world, Probably India has the majority of those. I mean, I, I've heard up to 1,500, at least, uh, you know, 750, all the way up to 1,500 different languages and dialects in India. And uh, y y I don't know the two specific languages that are on our back table, um, but I will say that one of our projects in India, it's very exciting, uh, in an um, independent Baptist uh, Bible college in South India, they have given us a wing of their college so that Worldview Ministries offers a master's class, a two-year uh, program in Bible translation. 
And uh, just to give you an example, we have um, in that class right now 10, and we've graduated 50 uh, through the years, but um, the 10 right now speak seven different languages are represented in just that one class. And so we're praying that uh, just even if, if, if a small fraction of those students feel led of the Lord to go on, to go back to their locations in India and take up a Bible translation project, the um, potential is huge there, really, uh, to see that number of, uh, you know, almost 4,000 people groups, to see that number come down in uh, giving them the Bible. But I encourage you to go by and pick up our literature on India specifically in, in the back there. Thank you. Someone else? Yes. How many Christian societies are you working with right now? Just uh, seven right now. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, sir. That's a challenge right there. Yes. Um, an unreached people group, uh, and, and I don't know if you're specifically asking about the 1040 window or anything like that, but uh, the unreached people groups are just people that uh, don't, uh, they're, not, they're not reached. There's, there's no Bible in their language. Um, they're, you know, when you look at uh, churches, a lot of them are closed countries, and you can't just go in and start a church. Um, a lot of them are found in the 1040 window. Um, but uh, that's what we're talking about, people that um, where, where the gospel is not prevalent, where the, there is no Bible, uh, that's what we're referring to there. Uh, it's not to say that uh, there's not a representation of someone from that country or that language that has been saved through the years. Obviously, we believe in the imminency of Christ and all of that, um, but it's just where the, the gospel is not prevalent. Yes. We have, we do not, uh, though there are other ministries that do Bible translation. We have on occasion uh, conferred with them and um, asked them specific questions um, regarding some aspects of Bible translation, but uh, really we're doing everything our, ourselves right now. Yes. Yes, sir. Great question. We get that question a lot. Um, there are numerous uh, Christian printing um, opportunities here in the States. Uh, Dr. Ken Fielder, um, believe, he's not against using uh, printers here in the States, but he would prefer for the printing to be done in the country that the Bible is being uh, published. And so um, he just, th he believes it makes it more of their own, uh, you know, um, ministry project um, and, and just to, to you know, uh, see it done in that country is something special for those that are involved with the translation work. Good question. Anyone else? Yes. Absolutely, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They have uh, those working on the New Testament are. Um, pastors who have had Bible training, uh, Bible Institute training, Bible college training. They've had Greek. Uh, we send uh, professors over um, when they are involved with the, the project and they've signed on to say we want to take on a project. Um, we have five pastors in the Mahdi language in Uganda that are giving five years of their life, eight hours a day, five days a week to translate the New Testament into the Mahdi language. They're all pastors that have Bible college training. They've had Greek, and then we send professors over for weeks at a time to give them principles of Bible translation. Yes, ma'am. I, I believe so, yes. I mean, th there's always that. The devil is always trying to get the, the false teaching in wherever he can, you know, and so... There is, we, um, we've not had any conflict with any of them, but they certainly are busy and active and oftentimes put, uh, you know, us as born again believers to shame in their um, enthusiasm to uh, reach the world. Very good, yes. Yes, sir, we use the Greek Texas Receptus for translating into the heart language in the New Testament. Yes, sir. And Hebrew Masoretic for the Old Testament. Yes. Yes. 
Is I'm sorry. Well, that's what we do. We we back translate. Though every language, um, the readability may be different. You know, we say I go to the store. Another language may say to the store we go. But it's going to be accurate as far as the the words that have been given in the Greek, uh, which is. Yes, which is one of our distinctives. We believe in a word-for-word -word equivalent, equivalency, formal equivalency, and so. Not always right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The the back translation just helps us, helps the translator see if they're on the right track. Yes. Yes. You know, I've been to Uganda twice and India twice, and, you know, it's just different parts of the, those countries. You know, the cities, you know, you're going to have folks that have more of the, the Internet and TV and all of that. Uh, out in the, the country, you know, we, we took a flight from Entebbe up to Arua, and you just um, you look down and you just see um, rural, um, you know, huts and, and not, no electricity, just campfires and things like that. So it just depends on the part of the country uh, that you're going to. Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Elizabeth. <laughs> That's, Worldview does help them with it. Um, we, do not, um, we do not pay them because we want it to be a ministry, but we help with their needs. Um, for example, these five pastors that moved uh, from, they moved six hours from where they lived and where they pastored, and they uh, turned their churches over to capable hands while they're, they're giving themselves to this project. They moved to a, a missionary's compound where the missionary was willing to give them por parcels of land where their family could, um, you know, plant food and, and all of that, plant crops while they're working on this Bible translation. And so Worldview Ministries when churches give to particular projects, what that money is going to is to help with food and help with medication and even helping with schooling for their children. Uh, so that's how we do it. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think I've ever had that question. That's a good one. Great questions. Very good. Anyone else? Please see us in the, in the foyer. We'd love to answer your questions to the best of our ability and uh, appreciate uh, your, your interest and uh, the good questions uh, tonight. Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Appreciate that. We're going to invite the churches to minister by way of a special number at this time. Then we'll dismiss the youngsters for children's church. And we'll be back to you when we join you in a little bit. Thank you. Every 
that when Jesus died, God's wrath was satisfied. Urge them to flee to the Lamb who was slain. Look to the throne for the sake of his name. Think of the throne who will share. Amen. Please take your Bibles and uh, very quickly, we're going to turn to Matthew 28 and then we're going to turn to Acts chapter 1. Uh, appreciate your prayers. Uh, we started a year ago, September, with deputation. We're uh, a little over 50% of our support. We've been in 125 churches and 115 of them have been just in Ohio. So Ohio has been very good to us. We just got back from our very first trek out of the state of Ohio, we spent 30 days in Florida. I know what you're thinking. Oh, you really are suffering for the cause of Christ. And uh, it was very nice down there, very beautiful. We thought we'd come home to, uh, you know, green grass and, and the flowers poking through. And uh, we came home to uh, snow. And so uh, what we have in Ohio is uh, almost what you have here. I think you've gotten... Uh, received a little bit more snow than we have. But uh, anyway, we uh, covet your prayers. Even more importantly, um, that you would pray for us. We ask you to pray for the ministry of Worldview Ministries and the unreached people groups of the world. Pastor asked about the unreached people groups of the world. In Bible translation, we're talking about languages that don't have any Bible, no, not one verse of Scripture in their language. Uh, if you're from a church uh, planting um, aspect of the unreached people groups of the world. I believe they define it as uh, th there is such a small percent of Christians in the country that um, it's not likely that they're going to be able to evangelize the entire nation. Uh, that's the dictionary definition of unreached people groups. Uh, we know that God can just use one person to, uh, you know, uh, be salt and light, and we understand that. But um, we appreciate your prayers for. Uh, Worldview Ministries and the um, uh, 4,000 people groups roughly that are still waiting for the Bible and we covet your prayers there. Look at Matthew chapter 28 as we come to a missions conference. I really do feel very blessed and, pr and just really uh, a tremendous privilege to um, be able to preach tonight. And so thank you again, Pastor Brown, for the opportunity. It means so very much. And, uh, you know, as we're looking at missions, I, I just want us to pause and look at the Great Commission. Uh, I think that's um, why we are here tonight, and, and I think it's good to start by, by looking at Matthew chapter 28, and look with me at verse number 18. Many of you know it well, you know it by heart, you're familiar with the Great Commission, but notice what it says in verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so I, I believe it is the responsibility of every Christian to be actively involved with the Great Commission. The average Christian, I believe, especially in America today, believes that the Great Commission is given to the church. But I want to remind you of something that you probably already know, and that is that you are the church. I am the church. I believe one day that we will stand before God and we will give an account for what we did with God's Great Commission. Oswald J. Smith said one time, he said, the only task, the only task that Jesus Christ left for his disciples here on this earth was the evangelization of the world. And sometimes we look at the Great Commission as, you know, a part of the Ten Commandments. And if I, if I choose to do some part of the Great Commission, then my, my life will be better. But, you know, it's just part of, uh, you know, becoming a good Christian. I want you to know, I agree with Oswald J. Smith when he said that the, the, that the evangelization of the world is the only reason why we are here on this earth. That means the moment you get saved, God doesn't just zip you up to heaven because he has a reason for you to be on this earth. And that is to take as many people with heaven to heaven with you uh, when, when, you know, our life is done, that we have we have seen people saved, that we've given the gospel. I believe and this is just by way of introduction. I believe that every believer, every Christian needs to as they as they align their life up with the Great Commission. I believe they need to ask themselves three questions. Uh, again, this is just by way of introduction. Number one, am I surrendered to go to the uttermost parts of the world? Paul, the apostle in, in, in Acts chapter 9 said, Lord, the moment he got saved, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? God answered that in that same chapter. He said, you are a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. The moment you get saved, if you say, God, what, what do you want me to do? The answer for you is the same as the, the answer was to the Apostle Paul. You're here on this earth for one reason and one reason alone, to bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. That may be that you're a doctor and, and, and you're a Christian doctor. You're to use uh, you know, your profession as an opportunity to be salt and light. You may be a construction worker. You're, you are to use your profession uh, to be salt and light. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But if all of the disciples had been builders, he could have said, follow me and I'll make you builders of men. If they had been teachers, he could have said, follow me and I'll make you educators of men. The, the point is, whatever God's called us to do, it doesn't matter if, if it's, uh, you know, a, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, we're to use our profession to fulfill the Great Commission. And so, Am I surrendered? Number one. Number two, am I willing to sacrifice? We have two responsibilities. We either go or we give so that others may go. That's it. Those are our only two options when it comes to the Great Commission. I either go or I give so that others may go. Am I willing to sacrifice? What does that mean? Am I willing to do without so that others may go? Am I, a will am I willing to, to give up a few comforts so that others may go and be on the front lines uh, uh, for us. Uh, I remember we had an old preacher that came to our church and he said this. He said, the average American gives more in a year to take care of their pets than to give money to the other side of the world so that missionaries could go and give the gospel. And so that's very convicting. Are we willing to sacrifice so that others may go? And then thirdly, am I soul conscious? Am I surrendered? Am I willing to go? Am I willing to sacrifice so that others may go? And then number three, if others go and I stay here, am I soul conscious here where God has put me? Am I salt? Am I light? With that in mind, we're not going to speak about all three of those tonight, but we want to talk about that last one, the, uh, the aspect of am I soul conscious. With that in mind, turn to Acts chapter 1, please. Acts chapter 1. I appreciate you allowing me to preach a sermon within a sermon, all right? So now we come to a very short uh, uh, thought tonight. Really, I mean that, but I, I hope that it will challenge us as we think about finishing Christ's work. Look at chapter 1 of Acts 1 uh, 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 and verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse number 1 of chapter 1. 
The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus, notice what it says, began both to do and teach. Let's talk about this thought from this text, finishing Christ's work. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless. Father, we need your help. We pray that you would use the power of your word and the power of your spirit to do a great spiritual work in our hearts, in our lives, in our marriages, our families, our church family, and in our circle of influence as you called us to be salt and light. Father, we thank you for this pastor and his family. We thank you for this church family. Father, we're so thankful for the bright light that they are not only in this community but around the world as they have a heart for missions. Father, please, we pray that you'll bless now this time of Bible study and teaching and preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever considered this, that there is something that the Lord did not finish? Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or, or, or uh, heretical or anything like that, but there's something the Lord did not finish. Now, we know it's not creation, amen, uh, for creation is complete. Genesis 131, God the Father saw that everything he had made, it was, behold, very good, he said. Uh, so creation is complete no matter what Charles Darwin says, all right? We're not going to have any more uh, new creation. Nothing new is going to, to come about uh, for creation is complete. And yet there's something the Lord did not finish. We know that it's not the scriptures, for our scriptures are settled. Amen. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We have that which is perfect in the word of God. We're not going to have any new revelation no matter what Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, say. Uh, we, we have that which is complete. And so the scriptures are settled, and yet there's something that the Lord did not finish. We know it's not our salvation, for our atonement is accomplished. Amen. Jesus said on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. And in this very text, he ascended and what? Sat down on the right hand of God the Father, signifying that he had accomplished everything that God the Father sent him to accomplish and sent him to do. And yet there's something that the Lord did not finish. And so while creation is complete and the scriptures are settled and hallelujah, our atonement is accomplished, there's one thing the Lord did not finish. And of course, we're speaking about the Great Commission. And the reason simply that he did not finish it is because it wasn't his job to finish. It is my job to complete the Great Commission. It is your job. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility to finish uh, the Great Commission. Um, one of my favorite verses is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 4, uh, we find these words, As we have been put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we have been put in trust with with Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, even so, we speak. Let me ask you a question. Are you a responsible Christian? Are you being a responsible Christian with the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have children, there no doubt has been a time in your life where you had another family's child come to your house and maybe spend the night or spend the weekend or maybe go on a short vacation with you. And you know the weight of responsibility that comes with taking care of someone else's child. We have a young man in our Christian school in Mount Vernon, Ohio, who graduated last year with my second son, Drew. And uh, he is a concert pianist. He was playing the piano by ear at age four. He's a child prodigy. He's amazing. He goes all over the country playing the piano. He came over to our house one time, and I must confess to you, I was scared to death. I just knew for certain that Bill Fennell was going to be the one parent in the world that was responsible for Tim Noble cutting his hand, breaking his hand, never being able to play the piano again for as long as he lives, and it was going to be my fault. He, he did so under my watch. As a little joke, as a little object lesson, uh, Tim was over to our house, and he and the boys were going to go outside and do something, and I said, Tim, come here, come here, come here, come, come into the kitchen. He came into the kitchen. I said, do this. Okay, he did this. I took two big oven mitts, and I put them over each hand. I said, okay, go outside, have at it. 
and uh, they chuckled. And uh, of course, I was joking around, but the point was be careful. Be careful under my watch, okay? Uh, don't do anything that's going to hurt yourself. And so, again, we know that there's this weight of responsibility of being entrusted with someone else's son. But wait, God the Father has entrusted you with his son. As we have been put in trust with the gospel, as we have been put in trust with the Lord Jesus Christ, we speak. Are you trustworthy? Are you a responsible Christian? With that in mind, I want to introduce you tonight just very quickly to a church that is an absolutely positively stellar church, model church for you and I today to pattern our lives after. And it's found in our text. It's a church that took the command of finishing Christ's work seriously. And we're going to call this church the Upper Room Baptist Church. Now, there's some wonderful reasons given to us in this text as to why this church is a model church. I'll give them to you very quickly and then we'll make our point and we'll be done. Um, this is a model church, first of all, because they have great leadership. Look at verse 12 and verse 13. We see the leaders of this church beginning in the middle of verse 13. It says, Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. I think you'll agree with me that's pretty good leadership, amen. And by the way, they're not great leaders because they were perfect. I'm so thankful for that. They're great leaders because they were faithful. That's it. Faithful to the cause of Christ. Yea, verily faithful unto death for the cause of Christ. You know, you can't ask for much more in a leader than they just be simply faithful to the cause of Christ. This is a great church because of their leadership. Secondly, they're a great church because of their uh, prayer life. They're a praying church. Look at verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. I believe prayer is the Christian's greatest privilege here on this earth to go boldly before the throne room of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our one mediator between God and man, has to be one of the Christian's greatest privileges. And this right here was a praying church. Not only were they a praying church, but they were a Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church. Look at verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, look at verse 16, if you will, men and brethren, this, what's the next word? Scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Now what's going on here? Long story short, the early church was asking the apostles about Judas. What do we do with Judas? We go out and tell folks about Jesus and they, they could in effect say, what about Jesus? Even one of his very own gave, gave him up, turned turn his back on him. Doesn't that give the cause of Christ the black eye? I mean, what do we do with Judas? Peter said, in effect, you know, whenever we have a question, whenever we have a problem, we go to the Bible because the Bible has the answers to our, our problems and our questions. They go to the book of Psalms. Long story short, they lo and behold find out God the Father was not at all surprised about Judas. God the Father wasn't pacing back and forth and, and, and worrying about Judas. No, God the Father used even Judas's sinful decisions to accomplish his perfect will. They're a Bible teaching, Bible preaching church. Let me give you another one. They were a church that did things decently and in order. Now, the Bible says we ought to do things decently and in order. They're about to have a good old-fashioned church business meeting. Not always one of my favorite things to do uh, when I was a pastor, but that's all right. Uh, they're about to have a good old-fashioned church business meeting, and they're about to have a good old-fashioned vote, and, and they're going to vote on who's going to replace Judas. Look at verse 23. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Verse 26. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So they had a good old-fashioned church business meeting and they voted and Matthias took Judas's place. Not only did they have good leadership, not only were they a prayer and Bible teaching, Bible preaching church, not only did they do things decently and in order, but uh, lastly, they were, uni they were unified. There was unity. You couldn't split this group up. Verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer. One accord means unity. Um, 
there's another verse that shows us they were unified. Um, uh, verse 27, if you will, look at verse 27. Wait a second, there is no verse 27. You say, this guy shouldn't be in Bible translation. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical, Pastor, about this guy preaching behind the pulpit. You know, I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek, and bear with me. In our day, there would be a verse 27, and it would say something like this. Justice got mad and left the church because they didn't vote him in to be the next disciple. Amen or oh my? There would be a verse 27 that would say something like this. Justice's parents got mad and left the church and started the second upper room Baptist church because they didn't choose their son to be the next pastor. Amen or oh my? Now listen, I, that may have happened, but if it did, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't believe it did, but if it did, it's not recorded, and I don't think it happened. You know why? I think they were unified. They were on the same page. They had the mentality, nothing's going to divide us. Nothing is going to split us up because there's a cause greater than my wishes and my will, and that is the cause of Christ. They're a unified church. And yet, this model church, this stellar church, this great example of a church for you and I has one thing missing, at least in chapter 1. And here's the point. They didn't have evangelism as of yet they didn't have witnessing they didn't have a world view they didn't have an uttermost mentality and the simple point is this that if the upper room baptist church stayed in the upper room guess what you and i might not be here today the simple point is this if the upper room baptist church stayed in the upper room uh the book of acts would be maybe one chapter if the Upper Room Baptist Church stayed in the Upper Room, the book of Acts could be called the book of apathy. But the Upper Room Baptist Church didn't stay in the Upper Room. They obeyed the Great Commission. They took it upon themselves to fulfill that uh, commission and, and took that responsibility uh, upon themselves. And they had a, a name change. They changed their name from the Upper Room Baptist Church, hallelujah, to the Uttermost Baptist Church. And by chapter 17, they had turned the world upside down for the cause of Christ. Now, how many churches in America today think, you know what? We're a good church. We've got good leadership. We have prayer and Bible study. We do things decently and in order, and we're unified, and yet they don't have a missions conference. They don't have a track rack. They don't have an invitation to come and get saved. They, they don't have uh, 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 any witness. There's no evangelism. There's no salt. There's no light, and they think we're a good church. How many Christians attend a church like that, and they think I'm a pretty good Christian? because I go to a good church and they haven't handed out a gospel tract in years. And they think I'm a pretty good Christian because I go to a good church. The question tonight is this. As we consider the Great Commission and the personal responsibility that God has given to us, what kind of Christian are you tonight? Are you an upper room Christian or are you an uttermost Christian? Consider this to help us discern what kind of Christian we are tonight. Number one, can you tell someone about Christ? Do you know how to lead someone to Christ? I've met Christians that have been saved 30 years that say, Brother Bill, I'm just not comfortable telling someone about Christ. I really don't know how to do it. I don't want to be unloving or unkind, but you need to learn. If you're a Christian, you need to learn to tell someone about Christ. If you don't know how to lead someone to Christ, you're like an EMT that doesn't know CPR. You say, Brother Bill, that doesn't make any sense. That's right. It doesn't make any sense to be a believer and not know how to tell someone about how to go to heaven. Consider this question. When's the last time you've given the gospel to someone? How about this question? When's the last time you handed out a gospel tract? When's the last time you invited someone to your church? By the way, I think you ought to have this mentality about your church. This is just me. I think you ought to have this mentality. I go to the greatest church in the world. And listen, bank teller, grocery store worker, uh, convenience store worker, I just, are you ready for this? I just have to invite you to my church. I just have to because I love my church so much. It's an awesome church. It's an exciting church. And I wouldn't be a good Christian if I didn't give you an invitation to my church. I think every Christian ought to feel that way about their church. When's the last time, number five, you prayed for a, a lost individual that was not a family member? 
Number six, when's the last time you had a burden for a lost individual? My definition of a burden, this just helps me, is a concern you carry constantly, meaning you can't shake it. It may affect your eating. It may affect your sleeping. My loved one, my friend, my acquaintance, my coworker, they're lost. If they died tonight, they'd go to a devil's hell, and I just can't shake that from my mind. When's the last time you had a burden for a lost soul? Number seven, when's the last time you performed an act of kindness for a lost soul just with the hopes that you'd be able to invite them to church or give them a gospel track or tell them about Christ? This next one's convicting to me. Number eight, when's the last time that you discipled someone you led to Christ? You know, discipleship is part of the Great Commission, teaching them, we read it a moment ago, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. When's the last time you sat across uh, the kitchen table with your Bible and someone you led to Christ and you taught them in, the, in Christianity 101 how to tithe, how to serve, how to lead someone to Christ, how to lead their family? That's part uh, of the Great Commission. Number nine, do you support the church's visitation programs? Number 10, do you support missions so that others can go? Did God assign an impossible task? Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Did Christ assign an impossible task? If not, then why is it that almost half of the world have never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did Christ assign an impossible task? If not, then why is it that almost 4,000 people groups are still without a Bible? Did Christ assign an impossible task? If not, why is it that this, this study just came out? I hope it's not true, but a study came out, Pastor, that said 95% of American Christians have never led one person to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Did Christ assign an impossible task? I don't think he did. I think... It's just that we need to take it seriously. May God help us to help Christ to finish his work. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we're going to turn it over to Pastor here in just a moment. I just want to ask you, say, Brother Bill, God's speaking to my heart about something very specific. I do not, know, I do not need to know what it is. But you say, Brother Bill, God's speaking to my heart about something very specific. Can I see your hand tonight? I'd like to include you in my prayer. Anyone like that? Brother Bill, pray for me. Anyone? Lord bless you, Lord bless you. Would anyone say tonight, Brother Bill, God has laid upon my heart a person's name that is lost and I'm burdened about their soul. Can I see your hand tonight? Maybe a coworker, maybe a neighbor, maybe an acquaintance, a friend, a family member. Lord bless you, Lord bless you all over. Lord bless you, you can put your hands down. Thank you, thank you. May God help us to be involved and take seriously the Great Commission. If you're here tonight without Christ, and I trust everyone's saved here tonight, but if not, we hope and pray you'll get that settled tonight before it's eternally too late. Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this pastor. Thank you for the privilege of opening up your holy, powerful word tonight to see what you have for us. Help each and every one of us, myself included, to help finish Christ's work. The only task... The only responsibility Jesus has left us to do is the evangelization of the world. I pray for every hand that's gone up that you give them the humility and the courage to do what they know is right to do. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to personally thank you for joining us for our service today and the message that we just heard from God's Word. Here at Kendall Park Baptist Church, there's something for everyone. There's Sunday school classes for all ages, youth, teen and young adult ministries with exciting activities and lessons that will draw you closer to Jesus Christ and a warm and welcoming congregation that loves people and loves the Lord. So while we're thankful that you've taken the time to view our service today, we hope that you won't stop there. Come by for one of our services on Sundays or Wednesday nights and see for yourself what makes this church truly special. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you soon here at Kindle Park Baptist Church.